I do have a question about Canada's Day. I want to see how good you know your national anthem, okay? The official version from the 1980 version, okay? This is where this comes from. It's the same in the modern, the, the one that was just changed. There is a phrase that is used most in, your, in our national anthem. What is it? Don't sing it. Just see if you rem- know what it is right now. Okay, now you have to sing it and see if you got it right. Anybody still thinking about Tavares? Okay, what is it? Oh, Canada, we stand on guard for thee. It's interesting. Anybody have a clue what that means? <laughs> I th- I just thought I'd throw that out there. If you go by one of the early versions, there was other verses to this thing. I, I, I imagine most of you know that now. They're very, I use the word very spiritual, very Christian lyrics. And uh, the stand on guard for thee was a very spiritual standing on guard. Not just a military standing on guard. Uh, it was a very spiritual standing on guard until he returned. Just thought I'd throw that out there. Not sure how many people realize that when they're singing today, but we'll leave that there for a few minutes. Uh, We're going to come back to that before we're said and done. How many of you have been enjoying the warm weather? (laughs) Oh, how many of you would have enjoyed a little bit more of this in January? Yeah, we're kind of funny people, aren't we? We kind of have this little range, and boy, how many of you will admit that over the last couple days, you've been a little bit more grumpy. Come on. Has anyone actually gotten dehydrated like I did? I was cycling. It wasn't pretty. I was out with one of the guys, and uh, he thought he was going to have to call an ambulance or haul me back or something. Um, A little bit of, are you okay? Not really. Weather does something kind of crazy to us, doesn't it? It's in the story today. It's an interesting one. I want you to think about that when we get to our story. All right. Uh, For those that uh, have been uh, over here the last couple weeks, you know we're in a series that we're talking about recovery. We're really talking about these kind of deep, personal, almost intimate, challenging questions. And it kind of leads into a discussion about maybe potentially depression. Now, we don't want to stay there. We're not going to be there most of the day, I hope, and, and we want to rise up out of that. How do we recover from that? How do we see it kind of, at least the darkest time, how do we get to the end of that? How does that become over? Now, as we began this series, we talked about this is a very sensitive topic. There's no way we can deal with individual questions. We're going to share some general truths. And one of the things that, that we wanted to share, and I mean that because we talked about this together, is that we wanted to talk about if you're in one of those moments or when you arrive at that moment in the future, one of the great things to grab a hold of is people of faith have been here before. <laughs> Matter of fact, I, as I mentioned the first series, uh, first sermon in this series, one of the challenging parts about this series was deciding which characters to pull from because there were so many to choose from who were really at the bottom at some point in their life, and it's recorded in Scripture. How many of you would like your worst moment of your life recorded in Scripture? How about that? So you could be remembered forever. Our character today, my guess is his worst moment of his life is what we're going to talk about today. Yay! I'm glad I missed that one. That's what is in the Bible, though. It's very honest. It's very open. We also have some stories that we've been pulling into and some characters that have done it well, even in their worst moments. Naomi, the first week, we talked about her and how she did this well, even in her worst moment, how she treated people right. I don't know if you remember that discussion, but remember how easy is it to treat people harshly when you don't feel your best? No confession needed. Don't look at your spouse or your kids right now. They already know, all right? Kids, 
you do the same thing, right? But she did it really well. Last week, Pastor Mark talked about Elijah and the way he dealt with this. We were going to real, really quickly kind of put some meat around what we've talked about over two weeks so that we can kind of fill it out today. What we've been so far, the first week was life does not go to our plan. It's one of the reasons why all of us find this. We plan life. We don't plan for really, really hard things, but they come anyway. And it's depressing when these things happen. And one of the things that Naomi did really well in that first talk that we did is that she found any thread of hope and she began to pull on it. She began to pull it closer to her so that good things began to happen. And one of the things she did is she didn't alienate herself from people. She stayed close to people, even in the hard moment. And that morning, we continued, and we talked about Philippians chapter 4, verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. And that's kind of how her story ends with rejoicing. Because she grabbed a hold of that first thread of hope, and it began to get bigger. Rejoice is this practical step to begin the way out of the pit. Now, if that's uncomfortable for you to go, well, you know, that's putting pressure on me. (laughs) Don't take it that way. (laughs) Take it as a lifeline to get out of the pit. (laughs) There is a way out. One of the first steps you can take is finding that glimmer that you can rejoice about. The next week, Pastor Mark began to preach about the story of Elijah. Great story, great sermon. If you missed last week, go on the YouTube page. You want to hear that story all the way through. And his testimony, where he kind of talks about his own life, is really powerful. Um, He talked about this being a really multifaceted problem. Elijah had a problem of sleep. (laughs) He'd been pushed to the limit. He was hungry. And all of a sudden, he kind of has this meltdown and there was this great kind of talk he, he put to about coupling the physical and the spiritual struggle. And sometimes the church has made it a real, we just kind of focused on the spiritual part, and the world's maybe focused on the, the physical part. We need to bring those two together. If you're in one of these moments or when you get there in the future, one of the first things you need to ask yourself, am I eating enough? Am I eating right? Am I eating healthy? Am I taking care of my body? Am I sleeping well? If I'm not doing any of those things, I need to ask the question, what do I need to make that happen? Can I make that happen? These things were extreme importance. But Mark went on in that, and I think he hit one of the best points, one of the failures in Elijah's life, at least at that moment, is he made it worse. Even though he'd been pushed to the limit, he then made that problem worse by going and being alone. He kind of went the opposite direction of Naomi. He goes off and he makes himself kind of off by himself. He's all alone and he feels alone. And it's not good for him. Philippians chapter 4 verse 4 and 5. Rejoice in the Lord. Again, I say rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. This passage, first and foremost, has this understanding that God is coming soon, but wrapped in all of that is God is never really far away. In our story today, we're going to get there again, that there's always this push when I'm not feeling very good. There's a push by many to be alone. And even if you find yourself there, here's the reality. Jesus understands that God is near. Jesus understands that reality. Why? Because he has been there. He understands what it means to be alone. To be left alone, to be abandoned. He understands all of that. And he also is near now. So as we kind of settle in today to hear God's word for you today. I hope you hear the love of God. Even if you're feeling an alone moment. That you're really not alone. Here's where we're going to end up today, and we're going to find it kind of wrap up with Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 through 7, uh, and just a little bit more, but we're going to read this right now. Read it with me so we kind of know where we're headed. Don't be anxious about anything. (laughs) Are you anxious about not being anxious? Oh, God, I can't can't be anxious? (laughs) Uh, But in everything, with prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God and the peace of God. I want you to let that settle in just for a second. The peace of God, which transcends all understanding.
In other words, it goes beyond comprehension. It goes beyond the circumstance of the moment. will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. You talk about stability, maybe even sanity. That's what this passage of Scripture is offering. And that's where we want to get to today. A God of peace that brings hope and sanity into our life. Well, let's tear into our story for today. And our story today is probably one that you may know at least a piece of this story. Maybe you don't know all the nuances, but you probably know Jonah and the whale. Did you know the whale's not really even, in some ways, the most important animal in the story? And it's not even really the most tragic part of this story. Here we go. Uh, jo- uh, Jonah chapter 1, uh, verse 1 through 3. And the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa, where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Now, from the very beginning of this story, you know this guy is messed up. All right? If you want a character in the Bible that's all messed up, you have found him. This is the reason why. Jonah, as the Bible says here, the word of the Lord came to Jonah. That's kind of the clue in the Old Testament. His ministry, his vocation probably, is he is a prophet. Do you know what prophets do? They share the word of the Lord with people. So he, here's the word of the Lord. The word of the Lord gives him an assignment, or that God gives him assignment, and he runs as far as he can the opposite direction. God said, go to Nineveh, which he could have easily walked to. It's been a, a, a bit of a journey, but he could have gotten there by land. He takes a boat, which he may have never been on in his life, and he had surely not sailed to the far end of the Mediterranean Sea to get as far away from Nineveh as he possibly could. He is messed up. There is something deeply, deeply wrong with him. God says, I want you to go and do this, which I've called you to do, you've been doing And he gives the most emphatic, not going to happen, no, that could be given. If we're going to go through each of the chapters really quickly, if we go to the end of chapter 1, we find Jonah being swallowed by the big fish. He's in a storm, he gets thrown overboard to save the ship, and a big fish comes and preserves his life. That takes us into chapter 2, in which in chapter 2, we find Jonah, and we've talked about this a few times at this uh, uh, journey, about learning how to lament, how to really complain to God, how to cry out for God. And he gives this wonderful lament in chapter 2. It begins this way in chapter, uh, verses 1. From the inside of the fish... <laughs> I wonder what that sounds like. From the inside of the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord, to his God. He said, in my distress, I called to the Lord, and he answered me. From the depths of the grave, I called for help, and you listened to my cry. Skipping down a few verses in 7, it says this. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord, and my prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. (laughs) So in this mess... (laughs) He actually talks about the seaweeds around his head. He cries out to the Lord for his life, and God preserves his life miraculously. Jonah was to a point in his life where he had this ability to cry out to God, lament to God, experience his miraculous salvation from God. Jonah chapter 2, kind of the end of chapter 2, ends this way. And the Lord commanded the fish... One of my favorite verses as a kid, and it vomited John, Jonah onto dry land. That is a wonderful picture for Sunday afternoons. Isn't that great? <laughs> uh, 
Oh, can you imagine how happy he was to get out of that fish? Oh, my goodness. Um, and you're thinking, how'd that happen? It's one of those miracles in the Bible stories, right? And you'd think it could not ever get any deeper, any worse than that moment in a person's life. That's got to be the epitome of the pit, right? It's not even close for Jonah. This takes us to the next chapter, in chapter 3. Chapter 3, verse 1, Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim the message I gave you, I will give you. You think he's in a better mood this time to do it? Jonah began to go to the city, going a day's journey. He called out, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. In other words, God's going to come and destroy you. Now, it raises the question, what is the issue with Jonah? Why is he so reluctant to go and do this? Well, he's a prophet. This is what he's supposed to do. He's got this message, hey, you guys are so bad, God is coming to judge you. Not a fun thing to tell people. Maybe the first thought is, maybe he's a little reluctant that maybe they're going to take his life. Maybe a little bit. That's not really what the scripture hints out. See, it has to do where he's going. Nineveh is a rising power in the area. Just matter of fact, just north of his country, it's becoming the power. He's already heard from other prophets that his country, Israel... Is already being judged by God, that it's going to happen, that there's a power coming that's going to destroy them because of their sinfulness. And Jonah begins to put two and two together and go, it's going to be these Ninevites. They're the ones. And so he has a deep, deep disgust for the Ninevites, the Assyrians, as they're better known. And... Um, The, the most awful thing happens in his mind when he goes and he begins to proclaim this message. And here's what happens in Jonah chapter 3, verse 8 through 10. We actually have what's recorded from the king of Nineveh. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hand. Who knows? God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. The king of Nineveh hears from Jonah and goes... Let's repent. We have no idea why this message was so uh, valid to them. There's, there's no information on why they turned their hearts. And here it goes down in, later in verse 10. And when God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. See, we begin to find out why Jonah is so reluctant. Why are you so hesitant? In Jonah chapter 4, verse 1 through 3. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly. I mean, that is harsh as you can get. He was livid with them. He was angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, is this not what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, and relenting from disaster. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. I told you who's messed up. Do you hear Jonah's honest words in this? I am angry at you, God, because you are too loving. Now, you're thinking, I would never think that. This is why he ran away. I ran away because you would not punish them. Have you ever been there? Have you ever been to a spot where it's almost painful for you to think that God would forgive someone else? Maybe that's hurt you or that you believe is going to hurt you? Because that's where Jonah is. It may have different layers of meaning even. Jonah's a prophet. He goes to this country. He tells them that it's coming. He looks a little foolish now, right? Did it happen? Well, he's not sure what's going to happen. But he's pretty sure God's not actually going to relent. When he begins to hear them repent, he gets angrier and angrier. Every time he hears another person repent, it's like, don't do that. <laughs> You're ensuring that God's not going to 
kill you people. But deep within him, he did not want these Ninevites to repent. He wanted them to all die. Wrapped up in this very first statement, it's extremely evil to Jonas what it says. It shows the depth of his anger. And this is where we're going to go for a few minutes. And I want you to begin to ask God to penetrate your heart, to open it up to you. And allow you to see reality inside of you. Because there is this truth that is recognized both in Scripture and probably even in, in the world. That unresolved anger leads to depression. Okay? Unresolved anger leads to depression. Do you think it's any coincidence that we have this increasing depression problem at the same time our anger issues are going up? Do you think there might be a connection between the two? There is. Now, this is not the only thing that leads to depression. I don't want to simplify that or make you feel that that's exactly what's going on for you because that may not be the case. It's a multifaceted problem. However, it is true that unresolved anger does lead to depression. And this is where Jonah is. Here's where he has gotten to. Go ahead and kill me. I don't want to live anymore. And if you've ever been in that spot or if you ever get to that spot, at least know this, that one of God's really good heroes in the Bible got there. He got to that spot where he just goes, I, I really just don't want to go through anymore. I want to be done. The world was so bad. What he saw was coming was so painful. I just want to be finished now. Just end it for me. Jonah chapter 4, verse 4, I think is the most important verse of Scripture in this book. And God comes to him and asks him a question. A question I think he's going to ask each and every one of us today. And the Lord said, do you do well to be angry? Do you do well to be angry? Different versions have it slightly different. I've picked this one because it really opens up the question. See, deep within, Jonah is believing that God is treating others better than he's treating him. Now, when you say that, you begin to go, oh, I've had that feeling before. My guess is every person in this room has had at least one moment where you've looked around at other people and said, God, you're being more kind to them than to me, and I don't like it. God was treating the Ninevites better than he perceived he was going to treat the Israelites. And he was so messed up with anger that their prayers of repentance only angered him more. Instead of bringing what it should have brought to the prophet, joy and rejoicing that his message had been heard and that people had repented before God and that he would not slaughter an entire town or a city. He is so filled with wrath that it only causes him more anger. And there is the challenge with anger. If you let it in, it takes control. You are no longer going to be in control. It will build and it will build and it will build. You are not its master. Nor was Jonah the master of his anger. He goes, and the question from the Lord is this. Is your anger justified? Do you have a right to be angry? He also, in this question, is asking, is your anger helpful? Is it doing you any good? Or is your anger destroying you? Do you do well? To be angry. Well, here's how the rest of the story goes. Jonah apparently stays in the town for a, uh, the city for a few days. 
at the kind of the close coming to the end of the 40 days, he goes out on a hill that overlooks the city. He builds for himself a little shelter, probably cut out of some palm branches that he's cut down, and he takes them with him. It begins to get hot, and the Lord allows a little plant, a plant to grow up and a vine to grow up, and the, the greenness of it all brings some coolness to him. And the Bible says that Jonah rejoices exceedingly <laughs> over the plant. He rejoices over the fact that there's this little plant that's slightly bringing just the modest amount of comfort to his life for one day. The next day, God sends a worm. <laughs> Same word that God sent the great fish, now God sends a worm. Both of them are meant to save Jonah. The worm comes in, gnaws on the plant, kills it. At the same time, God sends a very hot wind. It's a special wind that can raise the temperature up over 40 degrees in the desert almost instantly. It dehydrates you. It actually almost makes people delirious. It's so hot. And it's in this kind of temperature, discomfort, agony, that God talks to him again. Verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 9 through 11. But God said to Jonah, Again, do you do well to be angry for the plant? <laughs> he adds this, he's focused on this plant, this little piece of comfort that he'd had for one day. And Jonah said, yes, I do well to be angry. Angry enough to die. <laughs> Think about it. In this moment, he is significantly more angry than when he was in the fish. Because <laughs> there he's pleading for his life. Here he is asking to die. And the Lord said, you pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should, it, and should I not pity Nineveh, the great city, in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, and also much cattle. It's kind of an interesting way to end a passage. Aren't even the cattle more important than the vine that you're so worried about? And this is where the story ends. What happens when all comfort is removed? I'm asking this question of you. When it's hot, when it's humid, when you're sweating, when the air conditioning is not working, when people are on your nerves, what happens to you? Is that when you get in touch with the anger that you really don't know most of the time? The answer is yes. At least that's how it is at my house, when I'm around. When I'm at my worst is when these things start to happen that I go, where is that coming from? I thought that was hidden. <laughs> I thought I had that under control. And here's the beautiful part of this passage of Scripture. When we are at our worst, the worst moment of your life, when you're in the pit, when you're screaming out, just kill me, I don't want any of this, you're having a temper tantrum, you're throwing things, you're so angry, God is still there. God is still there to meet with you, to talk with you, to draw you back to Him and ask that very simple question. Is it good for you to be angry? As I said, there's no happy ending to this story. We don't know what happens. We don't know how Jonah responds. We do know this. We do know he tells his story. It's the only reason we know this story. Because Jonah tells us what happened. So I'm assuming somewhere down the line, Jonah got his heart right. But we don't know it now. But we're left with this question. And I think it's intentionally left us with this question do you do well to be angry? Do you do well to be angry? To wrap up today with this hopeful passage from Philippians chapter 4 that we've been working in. Let's look at it again. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be made known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds 
asking questions. It's a great passage. The first challenge in this passage is to rejoice, to look for anything, for anything to rejoice over. It's the most challenging thing to do when we're angry. What do you focus on when you're angry? Your discomfort, your pain, your suffering. Everything is wrong, right? But let's admit, rarely in life is everything wrong. It's only our perception. See, depression keeps us imprisoned and just focused on what is going wrong. But rejoicing begins to take me out of that. Just like Naomi finding that first thread that she could begin to rejoice on. It begins to pull us out of the pit. The passage of scriptures encourages us towards gentleness. Re- think this through. Gentleness, this, I- this idea of being kind. Gentleness and anger are going in direct opposite directions. Gentleness wants to be kind to people and, and, and meet their need and think about them. Anger only thinks about me and I want to hurt others. The passage of scripture imperatively tells us to let our gentleness be kind even when you're uncomfortable. <laughs> even when the sun is bearing down on you like it did Jonah. Be kind. It is a choice. Even in her worst moment, Naomi treated Ruth well from two weeks ago. To do this, you ready? You have to choose to let go of an anger controlled life. Did you hear that? You have to choose to let go of an anger controlled life. And I might add, controlling others by your anger. The question is, do you do well to be angry? Does it help you? (laughs) Is it bringing about the kind of life you want? Is it justified? Have you really been treated so poorly that you have the right to be angry, (laughs) yelling and screaming at people who cut in front of you in a car? I always like that one because it just hits home so quickly to me. The Bible, that passage goes on and it gives us several things to think about. In this passage, it talks about don't be anxious about anything, but everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. It gives us actions that we can do. Once again, I don't want to simplify this too much. I realize this is a big question. However, there are some things I can do to begin to pull myself out of the pit and resist anxiousness. We're going to see how this connects in just a second. God gives prayer to combat anxiousness. One of the reasons why anger is so a part of our life is because we are anxious. We're not sure how the result is going to turn out. And so when somebody, even microscopically, begins to confuse the outcome for us, or we're not going to quite get what we want, anger boils over in us because we're so anxious about the outcome. You cannot be anxious and live an anger-free life. Did you hear that? You cannot live a life of anxiousness and live an anger-free life. The two are going to fit together. If you've got anxiousness, it's going to come out when somebody crosses your plan of life. See, here's the reason why God gives us prayer. God gives us prayer because he understands that life is hard. It doesn't go the way we want it to. He understood he was asking Jonas to do something that was super challenging. It was pushing him to the limit. He understood that. And that's the reason why he gave him the opportunity to come and pray. And thanksgiving is the part of prayer that turns the angry soul and the anxious mind in the right direction. I want you to, just right now, if there is someone in your life that you're really angry with, God or someone else, if you will begin to be thankful for the positive things in any part of life with that person that is good, you will be surprised how quickly your mind and your soul moves away from anger. The two cannot be in the same life. God, I'm really thankful for my children. And then be angry the next second? 
That's going to begin to transform you as Thanksgiving takes over your life. Here's the sad part. This is where Jonah could not get to. He heard these pleas of repentance from people, but he was so angry, he refused to go, yes, God, that is great. Thank you that they have repented. He could not let his soul go there, at least at that moment. And because of that, he ends up in depression. That's where he was in his womb. Don't make the same mistake. The passage goes on and he gives this wonderful promise. The promise is this, that the peace of God, his peace, his lack of anxiousness. <laughs> think of this through. God doesn't get anxious about anything. Not in your life or my life. He doesn't get anxious about human rebellion. None of that makes him anxious. And he's saying his peace will come and guard your hearts and minds. He's going to bring sanity to our chaos. He understands it is easy to become anxious in this world. There's chaos all around us at times. But he is promising his peace that comes when we rejoice, we're kind, and we pray with thanksgiving. He will come and protect your mind. He will guard your sanity. This passage finishes up just really quickly with this last little piece. How do I keep it once I get it? <laughs> Philippians chapter 4, verse 8 through 9. How do I stay in that? If, once I find some peace and I'm not living in the mess, how do I do that? Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you've learned or received or heard from me or seen me put into practice, and the peace of God will be with you. It's kind of continuing with you. I have to change something. If I want to live in this kind of life, if I want to stay there, I've got to change what's going in. I've got to cut out the chatter in my life. If you remember the sermon series a few weeks ago, that I've got to kind of cut out all this negative stuff that's coming in. I may have to change my music or change the news. If the news is depressing to you, quit listening to it. It's not worth it. Is it good for you to be angry? Is it being well with you? Whatever's bringing you down, whatever lives in you that's not these kind of admirable, wonderful things of life, get rid of it. Why would you continue to ingest it if you know it's bringing a lack of peace in your life? Well, the challenge for today, to be honest with you, the challenge for this whole sermon series is very simply wrapped up in this Story of Jonah. Are you ready to let go of anger? And you say, well, I'm not really angry. Well, hold on a moment. Under pressure, <laughs> under the heat of the sun, when things are uncomfortable, what happens? Well, I get a little angry then. Then something deep within is done. It may be a small thing that God, even today, wants to pull out of you. It may be a gigantic thing that you're thinking, I don't want to start this because if it does, I don't know if I can stop What's going to happen? God wants to help you with your anger. How do we do this? Well, we're going to turn to God in prayer. Worship team is going to come and play us this song, and, and I'm going to give you an opportunity while this song is ongoing to really ask this simple question. If you, I don't think I'm angry, okay? Open your heart for a God inspection. <laughs> God, is there really someone I'm angry at? Maybe even a little bit. Does it show in times of stress? Here's what I want you to do. Begin just to pray and let God reveal that to you. If God reveals something to you, just take that simple step of, God, I want to step away from that anger. I don't want to own that anger. It's not good for me to own that anger, to have that anger. I want to figure out how to get rid of it. Even if I can't do it all today, I want to start that journey with you to rid myself of this anger with this person that hurt me or wounded me. Or maybe even, God, it's you. I just don't think you've treated me very fair. God, I want to be honest with you. I want to start to root that out. Help me do that.
as you kind of get into that, I, I want to encourage you just to take that next step of just going, God, I am thankful for you. Once you get started in that Thanksgiving, don't stop. Don't let it die. Be can, continue to think about more and more things about God or others that you're really thankful for. See if God doesn't begin to stir something in your heart. This song that we're going to sing or is going to be sung to us is, is really a song about God's strength, that we can rely on God to do things that we can't do. And maybe you're sitting there going, I can't do that. This is too hard. I got too much in here. It, it hurt too bad when it happened, whatever. Years ago, last week, what's going to happen today when I get home anyway? God, I can only do this with your strength. Here's your time to meet with God.